going to be going across this part of the lake, which again, lots of lily pads, shallow water. And then we're going to go back into what's actually my favorite part of the lake, which is an area of the lake known as Old Crane Town. And most remote areas of the lake, uh, it's an area that has some of the biggest cypress trees on the lake. Uh, one of the questions we often get is about these cypress trees, because people don't think about cypress trees from Tennessee. But these trees were here before the earthquake. Not these trees necessarily. Some of these trees, but some of the biggest trees on the lake are definitely pre-earthquake. And the biggest tree we're going to be looking at today that I'm taking three back to is actually the largest individual cypress tree I found here on the lake. And we've not actually measured it yet. We've actually got a project coming up this fall with the University of Tennessee at Martin that we're actually going to get out here and document some of the biggest cypress trees on the lake. But it's in the neighborhood of 80 feet in circumference. I mean, it's huge. Could easily be a thousand years old, maybe older. And we have a lot of pre-earthquake cypress trees here on the lake. We're going to be looking at some of them on the trip today, but once again, it probably won't be live, so you'll have to join us later. So just kind of a quick uh, history lesson before we... The cypress trees are one of the few trees that can survive in the standing water. And a lot of these trees out of the water are actually pre-earthquake. And these, these trees may be three feet deep, five feet deep before you get to the bottom. And actually they have a double root system. They have the original roots where the land would have been pre-earthquake 200 years ago. And then they formed another root system right at the surface of the water that looked like an umbrella with a stem going down that original root. Now the only time you can actually see that is during a drought like we had back in 2010. And uh, I got some really good photographs and didn't have video at the time, but uh, documenting some of the shallow water cypress trees and the, the double root system. Or we may get lucky, and if we find one and sometimes where a tree's fallen over, you can see that double root system. But, uh, the trees out here in the water are just surviving because there's not a lot of nutrients. So they're not near as big as the trees back in the woods, even though they may be older than the woods, ones back in the woods. Just biological conditions affect their growth rate. But of course, Realfoot is known for its beautiful cypress trees. And something a lot of people don't uh, know about those or think about them, the cypress tree is not an evergreen. It's called bald cypress because it is a conifer related to the redwood, actually, out in California. But it loses its leaves in the winter. But they turn a really beautiful rusty red in late October before the leaves come off. So fall color here, it's a great time to come. I love October is my favorite month in early November. You get the fall color, you get the thousands of white pelicans, you get the ducks beginning to migrate in, eagles beginning to migrate in. Just some beautiful days, beautiful temperatures to be out on the lake. So uh, fall is, is one of the great, and any time's a great time to be here. But, uh, but October, November are definitely times I really like to spend quality time out here on the lake observing. Anyway, Old Crane Town is named because if you go back into the 1920s through the 1940s or so, 1950s, it was where the herons and egrets nested and they were called cranes, even though the crane biologically is a totally different bird, but people call the herons and egrets cranes. And we actually had over 8,000 birds nesting back in this area of the lake. Uh, and they, a lot of uh, UT Martin had the biological station. They did a lot of research. Cornell University, which is known for the birding, actually did a lot of research down here on the heron and crane rookery. So just kind of a tease, so I gotta get the boat aimed back straight. So to get the, the equipment back there to film the movie, they actually blasted a short ditch, blasted it with dynamite from this part of the lake, which where we're sitting right now is actually the upper end a big Ronaldson Slough, which is an old river channel, once you get pre-earthquake when the Mississippi River comes through. So we have these old river channels. So it blast, they blasted a ditch from Little Ronald's, Big Ronaldson Slough over into Crane Town to get the boats back in there for the filming. So this is actually the biggest bottom of any tree that we found out here on the lake. And we're still looking, so there may be a big one. To put it in perspective, I'm going to get up in the tree let Bree film me and I'll push the boat off and she can come back in. But it, uh, unless you're standing in the tree, it really doesn't give you good perspective on how big this tree, tree actually is. And once again, we've actually got a project that we're working with with the Department of Natural Areas and University of Tennessee Martin to come out here and 
really try to document how big some of these trees are. But uh, this is the biggest one I've personally found as far as the size of the bottom, both where it comes out of the water and then to officially measure the tree, you measure it at four feet above the base, which is about where we are. So it's, it's gonna be a, a very large tree. Uh, cypress trees get huge. Uh, Google net, uh, Google internet searches and see the biggest cypress tree in the U.S., which is actually found in South Carolina. Uh, Tennessee had one that was struck by lightning a few years ago, and actually the 70s, that was over 60 feet in circumference, up at uh, chest high. So this one's going to be way on up there. So we're interested to see how big this one actually turns out to be. But we're way back in the middle of the swamp. But this is literally Old Crane Town. This is where the Heron's Egrets. Herons and egrets nesting. Uh, and when you look at this, I brought a, a couple of science teachers back here. We were filming some stuff for a science class back in April again during COVID. And uh, basically they said they could do a whole biology class at the bottom of this tree. Because when you look at it, you don't just have the cypress trees. You have persimmon, you have a maple, uh, you have some pawpaw, you have uh, some air fern that's drying up now this time of year, up, up on the limbs. Of course, you have poison ivy. Uh, you have several things <coughs> that are growing here. And then when you look at the bottom, you find where raccoons have pooped, which is how these trees would have got out here. They ate a pawpaw or persimmon, come out here and the seeds come out. So the raccoons live back here in the shallow water, as do all your other water animals, muskrat, mink, beaver, otter, a lot of otters back in here. And they use the bottom of these big trees. In fact, just where I'm sitting, you can see, or I can see that all this has been mashed down by the water animals. That, they live back here in the water, but they also need a place to get up and dry. And there's otter poop right here, or scat, and raccoon, raccoon and otter scat are the two that I see here. There could be something else. But uh, we wanted to come back to this big tree. And this is not a typical tree. This one's gonna be kind of hard to measure. The professor at Martin that I work with all the time, we've been talking about it, because it doesn't grow up into one big, big tree. It grows up into multiple trees. And realistically, the reason this tree is still here is because it did this. Because most of this area was logged in the 1800s, in the 1870s, 1880s. So if you were cutting trees with a cross-cut saw, this would not be a tree that you would cut because it would not have been a very valuable lumber tree. So actually a lot of our oldest, biggest trees here at Earlfoot were not cut when they logged this because they're unusual shapes or they're already hollow. So they're, they wouldn't have been good for lumber. But that's something else that we don't think about anymore that, that most of Tennessee has been logged. The trees have been cut. Individual trees were not cut for whatever reason. But the, overall the forest was, was harvested for timber and, and all of Ruffalt Lake was harvested for timber in the 1870s and 1880s. But we have some individual trees, and this is one of them that, uh, that were not logged. And this is definitely going to be one of the largest, if not the largest, and one of the oldest trees on the lake. And when you get a tree like this, the age is an estimate. Now, whether this tree is 500 years old, 800 years old, 1,000 years old, I, I don't know, that's something else that we're discussing with some of the professors that know more about this than I do, is, is how are we going to try to maybe get an age estimate on some of these really old trees? Because it, it's hard to get a core sample to go all the way to the center, once again, because of the unusual shape. So it, it makes it a little bit more problematic. But we know one of the largest trees and one of the oldest trees out here on the lake. So we wanted to come back to here. I'm going to be able to reach the boat. Marie's not going to have to come and rescue me. Or I'm not going to have to walk. Then we're going to go to another tree that's fairly close that does have the traditional shape that goes up to just one one big tree off the base. So it's also a very big, big, big tree. So this is also one we've not measured yet. But we'll be measuring this one, and, and I know some others that are fairly close to this size, or maybe even a little bigger, with this traditional shape. But literally, it's going to be a third smaller than the, the big one we just looked at that has the unusual shape to the bottom. 
But just like it, you have a whole biology lesson on the bottom of the tree. You have a persimmon tree that I'm standing here beside. Uh, we have some different little flowers blooming. Of course, you have poison ivy. You have a wild rose called a Cherokee rose. Here beside me, I can see where something is called a big old fish. Uh, looks like probably a buffalo. They drug it up here and ate it. Again, there's some raccoon poop, some otter poop. So these trees provide a, a habitat back here in the shallow water for a variety of wildlife. And literally the water back in all this area that we're riding through here, the water is about two foot deep. So holding up the boat paddle, all of this water that we've been riding through for the past 10, 15 minutes is about from where my hand is to the bottom of the boat paddle. So we are back here in some very shallow water areas. And on a dry year, a dry summer, uh, this can go completely dry. There's actually been several years since I've been here that in uh, August, September, October, we've actually walked into here. And we walked in all the way from the highway or from one of the gravel roads off the highway. Uh, we'll say it's an easy walk, but it's not that hard. It's just, to, uh, it's different than uh, walking back here in what's sometimes swamp uh, once it dries up because everything does tend to look alike. So one of the lessons I learned very quickly doing that years ago was trust the compass. No, just depend on your spotty sense to make sure you're going the right direction. When it's time to go back west, which the highway from here would be walking west, trust the compass. Today we're using GPS, GPS on the phone, we've got all the technology. One of the things I've learned about technology is it breaks. You get back here and you've got your, your eye finder on your phone and you've got eye hunt maps or whatever and everything's great, but then you let your phone go dead. And suddenly you're back here in the swamp and it's getting dark and you're depending on your phone and your phone doesn't leave the batteries go. So I, I use that technology, but I'm still also kind of old school that I have my compass in my pocket. At least, I, I may not come out at the truck, but I can come out of the road and then I can find the truck as long as I have that compass. And I know that I need to walk northwest to go back to the highway. I can go northwest because from right here where we're standing, if you don't walk northwest, you're not getting out of the swamp. You're just going deeper back into the swamp or eventually you come out of the swamp into the lake. So uh, technology is great and I like my technology. But I've also uh, learned to have a backup to technology. Uh, and that compass back here in the swamp is definitely the backup. Anyway, my favorite part of the lake. Uh, we're going to be quiet for a minute because this area is just you're so far away from people. The natural sounds just to, to get back in early. And you can, this is a great place to do kayak. Great to do kayak back in here. Uh, you need to get with one of us with a good map to, for us to show you how to get here, but uh, we can do it. Of just the, the sounds back here, the beauty, the remoteness. Um, just, just my favorite place to come to on the way. I'm going to be quiet and we're just going to film for a minute some of this beauty back here. 